Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the opening of GA 2017. Yeah, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, I'm Cheryl Fishbein from UJA Federation of New York and the chair of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. You all came here to Los Angeles because you are ready to get deeper into the issues. So let's get started. Today's session tackles the current political climate in two parts. In part one, we're going to address different perspectives on today's politics. Then there'll be a short break, and we'll pick up at 3.30 with part two, focusing on domestic policy. To say that America is polarized is an understatement. At root is an overall lack of trust. We Americans don't trust the political process, we don't trust the system to protect us, and most of all, we don't trust each other. We in the Jewish community are not, of course, immune from these centrifugal forces. We are drawn to watching the news and following the headlines nonstop. However, rather than just being observers, we now realize that it's time to re-engage in the system and to own our policies. The time has come to actively participate. The experts on the panel today are some of the best political interpreters in the world. So let's get started. <laughs> to welcome our panelists and lead the discussion is Danielle Barron senior writer and columnist at the Jewish Journal of Greater Los Angeles. Danielle? Thank you, Cheryl. So we are all super excited to be here today. It's an honor and a pleasure, and we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump right to it. Uh, but first, of course, I would like to introduce our panelists. Opposite me, we have Christina Bellantoni, who is the assistant managing editor of the Los Angeles Times. Then we have Hugh Hewitt, host of The Hugh Hewitt Show. We have Adam Nagurney from The New York Times. And we have Jake Sherman, senior writer at Politico. I, thank you. Yes. So thank, thank you all for being here. I want to start with a very brief, but I think important disclaimer, which is we are all journalists up here and at least one lawyer that I know of. Um, and it is the job of journalists to ruthlessly investigate and interrogate power, whoever is in power, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. So it is possible that you will hear criticisms today of the office of the president and of the government. It is also possible you will hear praise. Um, but I really want us to try to have open minds and listen to one another and listen to our experts up here. So uh, with that, um, I would like to start with a criticism of the media. <laughs> so I think it's clear that over the last many years, due to the advent of social media and a number of other factors, we have witnessed a spectacular change in the way American citizens relate to the press. Over the last year and a half in particular, the phenomenon of fake news and a US president who is exceptionally hostile to mainstream press have fractured trust between citizens and the media. So in your capacity as journalists, what are you doing to restore trust in news organizations? And how can we as readers distinguish between fake news and fact-based journalism? Who wants to start? <laughs> yeah, I would do that. I'll start. I wouldn't say restore trust as much as to maintain or protect trust. Um, I think and this is going to sound kind of corny, waving the flag, but I think the way to sort of fight this is just to keep trying to do honest, fair, down-the-line journalism. I don't think, I think that you want to write stories that are, that are balanced, that have both sides, but they tell people what, are going on, what is going on. And I think that the best kind of way to counter this assault um, is just with good reporting. This has been going on, certainly with the New York Times, for a long time. I mean, I think there was a, a long effort um, by some to discredit the Times as sort of like the voice of, you know, judgment in, in American society, um, which the Times helped a little bit with Jason Blair and maybe Judy Miller, I'm just saying. But it, I think Donald Trump has taken it to a new level, and I think this political calculation in doing it is pretty obvious, and 
I think that it's been responded to by, in particular, the Times, the Post, Politico, LA Times, who just, for the most part, really good reporting. So. I will say um, he's hostile, but when Donald Trump wants to make news, he calls the New York Times. Yeah. And a lot of the, what you said, Adam is right, like a lot of this is a political calculus. Mm -hmm. It is, yes, I think uh, the news media has done a lot of things that, are, uh, that have been wrong and have been mistakes. <coughs> campaign coverage, and you could fill us in on, on what he thinks about that. Um, but I, I think that the president's uh, distaste for the media is partially uh, a show. Right? He is in constant search of um, validation from the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and, and, and MSNBC and NBC. And, and and, uh, and maybe I'd ask. <laughs> and when the cameras are off too, he's very personally engaged with the individual journalists who are covering the White House. You know, he will talk to them off the record, be very friendly, shake their hands, so nice. And then the second he needs to turn it on and you know savage the media when it serves his purposes, which for his base, that's one of the things they want to hear. Uh, for me, I think the answer to your question is there are things both large and small. Right? There's the overall picture of, you know, the media does sensationalize things. And I would say everybody here on this stage is, is less guilty of that than some in television news, right? Um, people get irritated by the fact that it's, uh, you're covering a lot of the fight and the, the razzle-dazzle, which often is Conflict. really negative. At the same time, we also, we're all driven by analytics, and we know that's a lot of the things people want to read. People will call and say, well, did you cover the such and such education plan? And the answer is yes and no one read it. And we attempted to get people to read it, but people want to read when somebody is calling somebody else a name. The things that are small that you can do, and I talk to our journalists at the LA Times about this all the time, like, you know, it's the basics of journalism, like show, don't tell. You don't need to say the bombastic President Trump, right? His actions, in many cases, illustrate that on their own. And I think that having those small little details in the way that you report and write actually builds back some of that trust, where you just lay out Facts, figures, context. Should you, can I, okay, one, one question on that. Now, you, should you, because this goes to one of the big debates, because I agree with you, should newspapers use the word lie in describing what Trump is saying? That's right. the next, that's the real challenge here, I think. It, it is. I don't know the answer. Well, and, and lie signals intent. And I right. think in a lot of cases with President Trump, it's not always clear, maybe he doesn't have all of the information at hand, maybe he is purposefully uninformed on something. I mean, I think there are a variety of stages of non-true things that have come out of his mouth and his fingers on Twitter. And um, it is a difficult debate because we get letters constantly of people saying, why don't you call him a liar every day? Why don't you do this? And you know, we attempt to, to give context where we can. I'm really glad you brought that up. Hugh, I actually wanted to ask you about this because I know that you've talked a lot about bias in the media. And you're sort of considered as part of this media counter movement, if you will, where conservatives turn to talk radio and online blogging, et cetera, to offer diff alternative perspectives on what's happening in politics in America. So what are the dangers of only reading material that one agrees with? And does the fact that we can today, because of uh, the online universe, inhabit these sort of self-selecting silos, um, does that contribute, how does that contribute to less understanding and more polarization? Uh, the problem you refer to as epistemic closure, where you receive only your information from those sources with which you are comfortable. And it's very dangerous. Before we began, I recommended to Adam Nagorny that he read a brand new book called The World Without Mind uh, by Franklin Ford, man of the left, former editor of the New Republic, on how Facebook feeds are actually nudging you deeper into your cavern uh, and protecting you and, and cuddling you with only the information that makes you feel good and does not present uh, any kind of challenge to your worldview. Both left and right are guilty of this. I can't overstate, this audience is not my typical audience, how much my typical audience, a talk radio audience, I'm a contributor to the Washington Post, I'm an NBC News analyst, I have my own show, I'm an MSNBC, I live in all both worlds, but my core business is right-wing talk radio. And so when I go out and talk to a a group of conservatives who listen to talk radio, I cannot overstate how much they hate the media. Yeah. Hate, hate, 
hate the media, not to violence, but just they don't believe it. They believe it's an assault. So much so, I, I, I believe Lee Corfman, the accuser of Roy Moore. I read the, with the 35 years of lawyering eyes, her account, corroborating narratives, all that. I, I just believe that the judge uh, assaulted her when she was 14. Uh, he should withdraw, and if not, I'd like Luther Strange to resign, because I think that would trigger, I've come up with this great way to avoid this train wreck. Um, if he resigns, then I think it just starts over and we have a new election. But the reason Roy Moore might win is because people hate the Washington Post more mm -hmm. than they hate an allegation of child abuse. That's how badly out of sync elite media is with America. To restore that, a few of us are doing what I do almost every day, make sure members of the mainstream media are on my radio show and that they are presented in the round as living human brings. If you cut me, do I not bleed? And so bring on Chuck Todd and Jake Tapper and John Dickerson and Jake Sherman comes on once a week or his cow, Paul, Anna Palmer or Dan Lippman, just bring them on because media tends to live in a cocoon of very elitist opinion. So Adam, I understand you're working on a book on the history of journalism at the Times over the last 40 or so years, yeah. correct? So I want to point out that a few days after the last election, um, Arthur Sulzberger Jr. and Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the New York Times, sent an editorial, they published an editorial in which they basically called for reflection and rededication to the mission of journalism. And they asked in this editorial, quote, did Donald Trump's sheer unconventionality lead us and other news outlets to underestimate his support among American voters. So going back to that idea of distrust in the media, there was a real sense of letdown that the media, a lot of the mainstream media had offered a narrative that turned out to be very, very wrong. The polling was wrong, the predictions were wrong. So how did the New York Times fall short, during, and, and how did the media fall short in general during coverage of the 2016 election? So I think, um, so the thing you're referring to is, I think it was actually a letter that the publisher and the executive editor sent to subscribers, because people were really upset with the New York Times and other media for the um, coverage of the presidential election. No one saw Trump coming, and I think that I'm really against sort of predictive journalism, political journalism. I think it's, you know, but you don't want people to be surprised by the outcome. And people were shocked. Um, I, think, I think overall the reporting was good during the, during the session, during the last uh, s s cycle. And I actually think that we and other organizations did a fairly good job of capturing some of the anger that was out there among Trump voters. I mean, if you go back and look, which I did, I think it was there. But here's what went wrong. Um, everyone used, uh, in our case, it was the clicker or whatever that showed, you know, that Hillary Clinton had an 86% chance of winning, okay? I have no problem with that kind of predictor, predictive model. It's, people like to read it. It's, it's, it's candy. It's clickbait, right? It, makes, it made liberals feel good, right? Because they were worried that Trump was going to win. The problem was twofold. First of all, every day, most obviously, readers were picking up their phones and seeing, because it was at the top of the site, right? You know, today Hillary Clinton's chance of winning is 87%, right? So everyone just assumed, you know, no matter what anyone else was writing, that Hillary Clinton was going to win, right? I, I'm not even going to entertain uh, the argument by some of the, some of the analytic people that, well, 87% chance of winning means you have a 13% chance of losing. Fine. I don't think most people look at that and say, oh, she has a 13% chance of losing. But the really pernicious part of this, in my opinion, and I don't know if you're going to agree with this or not, is that it influenced the reporting, right? It wasn't just um, it wasn't just our readers that were looking at that. It was the reporters and the editors. And I think that if you looked at a lot of the covers t t towards the end, with some notable exceptions, Ron Brownstein wrote a really I, don't, I think it was for you guys. But he wrote a really good piece about this. Most people were writing stories about how Hillary Clinton was going to win or how Donald Trump was going to lose. And I think that a big reason for that is that the journalists were sort of misled or lulled by this. Uh, but this sort of analytical predictor as everyone else did. So I really think that was really the main problem. And, um, you know, I think the one thing, we could have done lots of stuff different, but I think one thing that would have been good to have done differently would have been, you know, t towards the end, to sort of, it's always good to try to write, I, I love writing counterfactual stuff because it just gets people thinking and upset. Um, and I like getting people thinking and upset. So it would have been good to try to run a story that talked about how Donald Trump could win because, 
it was possible he was going to win. That 13% was out there. He, it was possible. And that was happening in the alternative sphere. Maybe right. you want to address a little bit of that. I mean, I think there were. Well, one of the facts, I don't know how they missed this. Uh, I'm from Warren, Ohio. Trumbull County is a deep blue county. It voted in the year 2000 for uh, Al Gore by 59%. In 2004, it voted for John Kerry for 60%. In 2008 and 2012, it voted for President Obama 61 percent, and in 2016, Trumbull County gave 55 and a half percent of its vote to Donald Trump. It is a blue-collar, General Motors, steel town that is down on its luck, that's awash in opioid and fentanyl, and the earthquake that occurred, the seismic, the San Andreas Fault of American politics starts at Pittsburgh, comes up the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, turns left at the lake, and goes along the Great Lakes to Michigan and Wisconsin, and it's been hollowed out, it's been emptied out, and they ain't got the money, and it's a profound change. So there were so many false positives. I went to every debate. Uh, Secretary Clinton won all three debates. Um, Donald Trump, I participated in four of the Republican debates. He can't give a good answer on many things. I asked him the toughest questions of anyone throughout the entire, I have more Trump tattoos than anyone in the business after, because <laughs> he always gives you a tattoo after you embarrass him. He always does. and so. But while they were talking to each other, they weren't talking to America. I think the biggest problem is no one actually discovered that J.D. Vance's hillbilly elegy is 100% correct, right. that a lot of the country feels completely disassociated from those of us with safety nets and money. And there's a newsroom diversity issue, too, I will say. And I think that we all just need to kind of address that as somebody in leadership at the LA Times. You know, we talk about this a lot. You know, there are a lot of people that sort of view collectively the way LA views collectively politics. And I have a former reporter of mine who lives in DC now, and she's from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And she called me like a week before the election. And she said, I went home, and houses that used to have Obama signs in their front yard all have Trump signs. And I hadn't, you don't see any Trump signs here until you start driving up to Bakersfield, right? Um, or it's, a, it's rare, I, you know, I shouldn't exaggerate that. But there's, there's an issue when you have more people on your staff that are from different parts of the country, that are from different backgrounds. You know, there's a little bit of, you know, people are well-educated for the most part in the top media establishments. On the East Coast especially, people kind of come from that Acela corridor from New York to D.C. And so getting out there, it's, you can't just drop in to, to this county. It's harder to do that. The best reporters can, but you don't really absorb exactly what people are talking about. And I think we can't forget the people that didn't vote, right? Because it's not just, you know, what signs did you miss, right? There's a lot of people that made a choice that for them staying voiceless was more important than choosing somebody they didn't like. I just want to yeah, go ahead. Put a two different things. I, I think I'm going to defend the reporters to a certain degree. I think what you said is right. I think we were relying on many cases fatally flawed, right? We were working in the conservative sphere online. Uh, people said, you know, this is a D plus six, which means the polls were weighted to account for a universe, a voting universe that no longer existed where Democrats could not be able to vote for Democrats. That universe didn't exist. And I also take issue with the fact some people say, well, if the New York Times had reporters knocking on doors every day in Ohio, uh, they would have gotten selection right. Like, you know, that's not true. That is not true because you could knock on a hundred doors and you could knock on the wrong bunch of doors. So I think it's fundamental problems. Also with polling, people have cell phones. People don't have home phones. So the people that are reaching at home are not the right kind of voters that are going to be representative of the overall universe. So yes, I think reporters did a lot wrong. Media organizations did a lot wrong. But I think political science system was not accounting for a reality that I'll add, one, I'll add one yeah. more thing. Okay, um, I hope you agree with me, you. At, no, I do. <laughs> okay. At, at 30 Rock, um, on the night of the election, I was on the panel, uh, sitting next to Carville, Chuck Todd, Lester, Savannah Guthrie, Tom Brokaw. Uh, I was the only person in the building who announced that they had voted for Trump. I was a reluctant Trump voter. Three weeks earlier, I'd call on him to drop out of the race because of the Hollywood Access tape. He didn't, so I had a binary choice, and I made my binary choice for the president. I'm sure some of you did. Most of you probably didn't. But uh, I, I'm 60 years old, so no, I don't have to worry about my career. My, my career is done. I think, actually, it was a career killer to be for Trump in journalism and to find good things to say about He's done some very good things as president. He's done some really terrible things as president. And unfortunately, in media, it's a career killer. It's sort of like being a 
conservative in Hollywood is a career killer, uh, as I have been reliably told by a lot of people. And that is, a, that is bad for our business. It is bad to be uh, effectively shutting out, not wanting to promote, and turning into alternative. I mean, Breitbart's not a good site. It's not good journalism. I don't read it. I never touch it. But if young conservatives have to either hide or go to work for Breitbart, we're in really bad trouble. But I actually think, just sorry, I, I don't think that's, I agree with you on the whole, but the reporters that took Trump seriously before National Review did, when National Review was dumping all over him, and when all the conservative outlets were dumping all over him, was Bob Costa at the Washington Post, True. Maggie Haberman. I mean, this is the, the idea that he, he was seen as a carnival barker by a lot of people, and, and in some ways that was a... To the uh, appeal. That was a, I mean, listen, he, that's how he was acting. I do think mainstream reporters were taking him seriously. Jake, I do think, though, what you're speaking to is the fact that, whether we like to admit it or not, almost every news organization in this country is associated with some kind of political bias. Okay? Yes. Yes. So let's be honest about that. So I think the question for us as journalists is, how do you get outside of that political bias? How do you interrogate that political bias? What do you do as reporters and editors to ensure that, and I think you touch on this, Christine, when you talk about lack of diversity in a newsroom, um, what can we do better? What do we need to do to make sure that even though that sometimes we have to interrogate our own values as journalists in order to represent um, multiple viewpoints. And, and you have seen, you've seen a lot of organizations, you know, like that letter to staff the New York Times put out. We put out very similar things at the LA Times, you know, with a renewed focus on, you know, this administration and, and some of the crit the pushback on that was like, well, wait a minute, why didn't you have that focus on the Obama administration? Which we did. It's just that suddenly you have the people finally on the side of journalists, right? We are less popular than stockbrokers on the whole as a profession. And that is only now ticking up. And we had people sending free pizza to the newsroom after the LA Times got shut out from one of the White House briefings, right? There's a sort of collective feeling of we want good journalism right now. And so businesses, which are the media organizations, are taking advantage of that and saying, sign up for your subscriptions. We're going to hold the administration accountable. But there's, um, you're missing sort of that element of connecting with people. And so you know, we all try it. Well, every one of our organizations is going out there and asking people, what do you care about? What do you want us to be covering? What is your message for the president? How has the president affected your life? And we cover the good and the bad. And it's just that sometimes the volume of the other stuff and that the little bit of the distraction up here, it just is so much louder than the substance. And so the more that we can focus on you know, the meat and potatoes part, the better and the more respect that we earn and then the more people learn. So would, I would, would you yeah. argue then, I guess it's a little uncomfortable to go down this road, but would you argue that the media is overcovering the Russia investigation, which clearly the president would? And I'm not. That's an excellent question. Okay. And if we have time, we can come back okay. to that. But Maybe I really want to. Yes, okay. yes. And if, and if there's a way okay. to sort of weave it in, we could get there. But um, I want to move to what we liked, what many of us have called and heard referred to as the quote unquote swamp. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I would like Jake to explain that to us at some point. Um, but I do want to say, in preparing for this poll, I found that there was a recent Gallup, uh, Gallup published a series of articles dealing with American views on government performance. This is recent, within the last month. Oh, their conclusions were, overall, Americans' view of government is negative. Most US adults are dissatisfied with how the executive and legislative branches are doing their jobs. And majorities hold unfavorable views of both political parties. Even Republicans rate Congress negatively, despite the fact that they're in control of Congress. I think there's a 13% approval rating of Congress right now. Barely a quarter of Americans, 28% say that they're satisfied with the way the nation is being governed. So that's sort of abysmally low. The federal government has the least positive image of any business or industry sector measured by this study. Congress engenders the lowest confidence of any institution that Gallup tests, and Americans rate the honesty and ethics of members of Congress at, as the lowest among 22 professions that they study. So this is a big issue. And the fact that a majority of Americans think that the biggest problem in our country is the government itself is obviously huge. And they also cite what's interesting is that it's the bickering and the infighting, it's political personalities that bother them much more than government size, power, or specific policies. So this is fascinating. I think you could certainly speak to this. So. Um, 
Politico, of course, was described by Vanity Fair as, quote, an insightful Bible for Washington swamp creature class. Um, high compliment, I suppose. I think. Um, so, Jake, I guess the question is, you know, is Politico reporting the day-to-day -day palace intrigues of, of the Washington swamp uh, part of the problem? No, um, but I'm, that's like, I, <laughs> why would I say yes? Um, I, a few things to touch on. I don't think, first of all, Politico is an outlet that's of and about Washington. And so that's, that, let's just start with that stipulation. Like, it's our job to cover the daily rumblings of Capitol Hill. And people are, if, if, if uh, people didn't like it and didn't find it useful, we would go out of business. Um, so uh, my job is not to engender a, an environment that's conducive or to governing or not conducive to governing. My job is to tell you what's going on in the meetings that you can't get into and what your elected officials, the people that you pay for, to go to Washington, what they're doing. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a story about a congressman Aaron, called Aaron Schock, who was spending hundreds of thousands of government dollars on um, uh, illegally, and he's going to—he's on—he's been indicted for 26 charges of various uh, uh, service frauds. So, the idea that you can't cover the ins and outs of of um, governing in a meaningful and useful way is not true. And clearly the nation's uh, big media outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post agree, because they've hired basically all of our reporters. Um, <laughs> uh, that being said, I want to just touch on the swamp thing. Drain the swamp was Nancy Pelosi's 2006 saying when she wanted to take over Washington. So this is not a new idea. Barack Obama came into Washington and said, he was going to change the way things got, got done, and he was going to kick lobbyists out of the administration, and, and the place needed to be cleaned up. Donald Trump is saying the same thing. Um, you, we're all in Washington, we're all part of an ecosystem. It's all part of a, a game, so to speak. And if you don't play the game, if everyone's playing soccer and you're going to play basketball, you're not going to be a successful soccer player. Can we be clear, though? I want to hear from you. Like, What do we mean when we say the swamp? Professional like, political class. And, yeah. and people who live in and around Washington and lobbyists. Which um, is everyone running government, so you have all these people well, coming into government. And also the journalists that sort of play in that and the yeah, academics the that, yeah. <laughs> You're part of the swamp. Even You're living in LA, in LA, still in the swamp. It's okay. easy. But it's you are part of the swamp. This is no new concept, I'm right? I'm the University I, of Florida, so to me the swamp was the stadium my yeah. gators played, you I, know? <laughs> I but just what? finished the Bobby Kennedy book by Chris Matthews, and I was just again struck by the relationships that politicians had with the press even then. And like, it's it's not that different, right? We've all been out at bars with different consultants or emailing with David Axelrod or whatever, right? Like, there's a a clubbiness feeling that I think you can still be a responsible journalist and have relationships like that. In fact, they help you be a better journalist in a lot of cases. But people look at that and think, oh, you know, you're going to Joe Biden's party and your kid's having a fun time on the slide and so you're a terrible journalist. Like, it's all part of the swamp question. Mm -hmm. But Jake's exactly right. Like, this is something that every politician has said they would do and, and it's they been going on for find a workarounds yeah, So, hold every on, time. Hugh, I want to ask you actually because you, you had a relationship with Nixon and worked for him and also in the Reagan administration. So, how... Like, how, what was the political culture like then? I mean, is what we're seeing now, in your opinion, truly unprecedented, or is yes. it just the natural progression of no, democracy? This is, this is an, an epic moment that we are living through, both small and large. In the last 10 weeks, we have had three deadly hurricanes, one deadly set of fires, a terrorist attack in New York with a truck, a massacre in Las Vegas, and a massacre in Texas. Uh, that is um, enough news for 10 years. And it happened in 10 weeks on a news environment that is 24-7, which has been exacerbated, as discussed in this book I mentioned, World Without Mind, by people's Facebook feeds. So we live with stress, in media-induced stress, to a level that we have never done before, being delivered constantly. The average high-income American touches their iPhone 400 times a day. Oh. So that is not a normal engagement with the news. So that previously, people's friendships, were, which were based on shared communitarian ideals, you went to the same church, same synagogue, you, you, you belonged to book clubs, are now virtual, and they're never ending. And I think it is profoundly disruptive. So much so that I have a friend, a dear friend, I've been with him for 25 years, and he sends me clips about, 
you know, he hates Scott Pruitt. Scott's a good friend of mine. He's a very smart administrator. He's doing great things, and you'll actually get a lot of super funds cleaned up because he's living, but he doesn't believe in the clean power plant because it's illegal, and, um, and it's been ruled illegal. Well, my, my friend sends me every day whatever he can find that's bad about Scott Pruitt just to, <laughs> just to poke me. And, and I just think it's kind of a bizarre, hyper-conflict-driven world. One last moment, big moment in American journalism. John Kelly comes to the newsroom after the, Medal of Honor, after the courtesy call the president gave to the family of the Special Forces soldier killed in Africa. And he says, how many of you know a Gold Star family? Now, I won't ask you. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I know a lot of them. And I have lots of family members in the military. I was stunned that one person knew a family, a Gold Star family, one. And if I was going to go back to your first question, how do I help change journalism? I start hiring people who are coming out of the military because they have the best rankings of any institution in America. The highest, absolute highest. And I'd start recruiting at Hillsdale College, which, which has become the new Ivy League for conservatives. So I want to ask everyone up here, and I think you've, you've talked about this and written about this, um, which is, you know, so we're in this moment of this intense polarization uh, in, the, in the country politically, and it seems to me, and I think this is particularly true, and I can speak for the Jewish community as a Jewish journalist, that there are an increasing number of red lines um, in terms of conversation and discourse, things you can and cannot say uh, from the dinner table to the newspaper. So. What can't you say as journalists when it comes to politics? And I know that some have called for journalists to be more transparent about their political beliefs. Hugh's one of those people. Um, so what are the dangers in that? And do you think journalists should keep their political views private or disclose them in the interest of more objectivity? I think, I'm a little old school on this. I, I, you might disagree. And I, I realize this is an argument that keeps going on. I think that journalists should keep their, should, ideally you should try not to come to a conclusion on something you're covering. So if I'm covering a race, I really made an effort never to say if I was going to vote, because I don't vote in races that I cover, um, who would I vote for? It just makes it easier to do it. I am very careful in expressing opinions on almost anything in front of people. I just, I just think it's better. I mean, again, this is considered old school. Um, I think it's better to try to be viewed as as objective and fair-minded as possible. I, I, Jake, what do you think? Because you're I, sort of in the middle of uh, all of the the hullabaloo that goes on. Yeah, I, I don't vote. Uh, oh, interesting. Cool. I I interned for a Republican congressman when I was 17 or 18. So <laughs> if that if that okay. makes me a closet conservative, I guess that that's what I am. So um, do you feel like you're a journalist first and a citizen second? I don't know. No, yeah. I'm a citizen, yeah. I mean, I'm an American. I will say this though, my entire, the only reason someone would pay me or a reporter is because we could get information out of the people we're sent to cover. I've covered House Republicans and I'm writing a book about Congress which is now controlled by all Republicans. Uh, my only, what I do is I have to have good relationships with Republicans. I have, if I write a tough story about John Boehner or Paul Ryan now, who I, both of whom I know very well and have dealt with for a long time, I have to go face them the next morning. So the idea that I would have some sort of secret agenda to uh, uh, spread liberalism or conservatism through my writing is, 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 is fantastic. It's not, it doesn't, it's, it's not true. Uh, and uh, yes, what Hugh said is right. Like we, a lot of journalists come from the same background. A lot of them are educated at liberal arts colleges on the East Coast, and I, I get that. But um, it would defeat the purpose of but, but what you're I'm doing. Just, I don't, there's literally nothing in it for me. It would only hurt me and because I have to go cover these people the next day. I, so, so Hugh, what's the counter argument to that? Uh, Dan Rather said, news is where you look. And so if you get all of that, I, I teach at UCI, uh, one class a year, and it's all full of lefty undergrads. And I ask, okay, everyone who's pro-abortion rights, and they, you sit over here, those of you who are pro-life, there are a few of them, sit over here. Who owns a gun? You sit over here. And so I divide the room by ideology, so that it moves from left to right. So do you think I'm going to put out the same newspaper if I only hire from the last row on the left or the last row on the right? And they get it. They get it that most of the newspapers in the country are produced by people who are center left to left to way left, and that that has left behind readership. And as we became one ecosystem of information, it's offended the people who are not represented. Let me read you something from The Guardian that came out yesterday. See if this is a surprise to you. 
In Beirut's southern suburbs, where buildings scarred with wars of old blend with posters of the latest dead, talk of another conflict has taken hold. A fight on a scale not seen before may be brewing, say locals like Hussein Kadini, a barber who says he and his family in the Shia suburb of Daya have grown used to tensions over decades. This one's different, he said. It could lead to every valley and mountaintop. If it starts, it may not stop. Now, I've heard that from everyone. I cover a lot of national security stuff. That the Middle East is a tinderbox. And it's not because of Israel. It's because of the Shia and the Sunni, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And there is going to be a war. And it's going to make the ISIS war look small. How, we're not covering this because we're much more interested in beating up on Trump because an Adams boss put out a note to his team. I don't think Twitter's good for our team, he said, because we're giving away our political positions. We're becoming snarky. Glenn Thrush gave it up. And it's true, if you follow the feeds of, of reporters, and I do, they're off the job. And you get what they really think about people. And I'm shocked that the old school that Adam is nobly holding up, and I used to and believe Dean, And Dean is too, by the way. I was, I was really glad to see you wrote that note. Yeah, ex yeah, expand what he's trying to get people to start uh, doing. Dean's, you know, the, this is an issue, and it's probably an issue with Politico too, is people, it's, tweet, when you, when you write a story, you're edited by a lot of people that presumably removes any kind of, kind of the bias that you're talking about. I'm not saying it works all the time. When you tweet, you're just doing it, right? And it's difficult to do in a way like, to me, a reporter should be able to offer a point of view as opposed to an opinion. There's a big difference. And I think what you saw, and I'm not going to talk about Glenn Rush in Russia particular, though I do think that was the mitigating factor. The, the, uh, that's what caused Dean to write his note. Um, you saw people writing notes, that, that writing tweets, that really expressed an opinion. And I think the one that Dean was responding to was disparaging of uh, the president. Yeah. And the problem is when you have reporters at the New York Times who are doing that, and again, I'm not talking about any reporter in particular because there's been a bunch of examples, it, it undercuts our credibility and makes people in the White House, it reinforces the sense that we are an anti-Trump paper. And the other side of that is what's the gain of letting a reporter do these sort of super opinionated, snarky tweets. Like, what's, who does it benefit beside maybe a reader like me who likes to be titillated and the, uh, and right. the, and the, and the or correspondent super who wants more followers, following. right? So, yeah. so speaking of people who are, are, are contributing to the reputation of the New York Times being an anti-Trump paper, I heard